Ah, politics. The dumpster fire that, upon gazing into the flames and smelling the acrid stench, reminds you just how f***ed we all are. Now, of course, this isn't any new outlook I'm offering. No, most people have felt this way about politics since, well, politics. But some feel this way and attempt to offer solutions or analysis. We call those people political scientists and philosophers. And me, well, I'm your favorite armchair philosopher, Mr. Minarchist. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, welcome to my series on political philosophy. Now, I'm not sure how long this series will be, but who really cares? Jump on in to the rabbit hole that is political philosophy with me. I know, it doesn't sound too terribly interesting, but this is a Mr. Minarchist video we're talking about after all. Come on, it'll be fun. Now, let's dive into what is now known as classical liberalism, a philosophy that more or less defines the political landscape we all live under today. Now, to understand liberalism, one must understand the political landscape it was created under. It was forged under a dictatorship of sorts, an era of kings and queens that ruled via divine mandate. And it was the church that affirmed this divine mandate. And it was also the church that had a monopoly on education. In short, the system was wound tightly in such a way that there could be no challenge to its authority. However, the Protestant Reformation began, and this proved that authority could be challenged, at least when it came to doctrine. But what of authority itself? The Age of Reason, or rather the Enlightenment, challenged these age-old foundations alongside the scientific and industrial revolutions. Abstract concepts such as economics and governance became less abstract, and many strived to answer the question of how best to govern the new societal order that was blossoming. John Locke, considered to be the father of liberalism, was unlike most other Enlightenment philosophers in that he felt that tradition and progress could actually complement each other. It was his Protestant Christian worldview that shaped his theory of natural rights, a theory which proposes that we are immediately availed of certain rights the second we are born, and that it isn't a government that grants it to us, but God. Whereas government, even monarchy, is a contract undertaken by the citizenry who reserve the right to terminate that contract should those rights be challenged. Sound familiar? Indeed, John Locke was instrumental in influencing the revolutionary ideas held by the Founding Fathers of the United States. But he wasn't the only one. Wait a minute! Who are you? Je suis Charles Louis de Seconda, Baron de la Brède et de Montesquieu. Oh yes! Charles Louis de Secondant, Baron de la Bred et de Montesquieu, usually just referred to as simply Montesquieu, was just as important to the foundations of classical liberalism. But uh, he doesn't have a cool nickname like the father of liberalism, so for all intents and purposes, I call him the uncle of liberalism, or Uncle Monty for short. Now, Uncle Monty's philosophy was very similar to John Locke's, whereas Locke's theories included that of natural rights and the idea of the social contract, along with the ideas of religious freedom free from government control. Montesquieu, however, went a bit further. He theorized a more solid concept of a separation of powers entirely that there be a separation of the powers of government as a failsafe from tyranny and corruption. He also believed that government ought to be tailored to a particular culture and society, i.e. what may work for, say, France may not be the best system for Germany to employ, etc.
Now, of Papa John and Uncle Monty, despite their not having known each other personally, their respective works would go on to inspire generations. As I like to call them, the children of liberalism. Even America's own founding fathers cite the works of Locke and Montesquieu second only to the Bible when proposing their concept of unalienable rights. But well before the Founding Fathers, several philosophers would pick up the mantle after Locke and Montesquieu died. These children of liberalism were taking these core ideas, expounding upon them, and spreading them like wildfire. And well, like any of the greatest fads, people from all walks of life were eager to try out the newest trendy ideas. It could even be said that these philosophers were the influencers of their time. Except back then, it resulted in new liberal ideas. Even a generation of eager rulers enjoyed these enlightened ideas and were keen to adopt them as policy. At last, it seemed that the old rigid European structure of society was finally at an end. Care to question the human condition? By all means. Want to question the church or even the existence of a god? Go nuts! Wish to question the necessity of having a monarchy and propose alternative governance? Go less nuts. But at least one wouldn't have been condemned to the chopping block immediately as they'd have been simply one generation before them. However, these liberals had only tested the waters up to this point, and they were becoming overly eager to jump on in entirely. It's been 84 years. Yes, they were hungry for more change, and overjoyed at the prospect of the people becoming the masters of their own fate. However, in the face of these ancient institutions, that seemed a daunting task. But even the rulers above them seemed so open to these liberal reforms. It was just time to see how much was too much. The liberal principles I've described were indeed widespread, but these ideologies still took a back seat to the ancient institutions that comprised Europe. Sure, some of the monarchs were very open-minded towards these liberal policies, but the divine right to rule still outweighed those policies in any instance. Liberalism was taking a different shape from Locke's original philosophy as more expanded upon his ideas. Locke was, after all, a monarchist, but those who subscribed to his ideas were becoming less so. The Enlightenment made room for these theories to grow, but it also allowed the sowing of the seeds of discontent. For some, perhaps, it was time to try some of these theories, and apply some of these ideas. Liberalism had begun to fracture into other ideologies, like republicanism. All right, before I continue, and before anybody says it in the comments, yes, I know the Dutch did it before all of this, but I'm discussing Locke, who, like the Dutch, formed his theory on the ethics of natural rights on Plato and the Roman Stoics. Also, the Dutch had some city-state-esque republic thing going on, and I'm also abridging a crap ton of history here. Also, this is my video. We're discussing the Anglosphere. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say about the Freaky Deaky Dutch. Okay, perv boy? Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, so this rising Republican sentiment gave way to a domino effect, and the first domino to fall in the chain of liberal revolution was, of course, the American colonies. For most of its colonial existence, the colonists were content with British rule. Of course, there were outliers, but they were few and far between. However, that would change over the argument of taxation without representation, and well, we all know that story. So, it was no secret that the liberal sentiments from the works of John Locke and Montesquieu were greatly appreciated amongst the colonists. Couple that with rising Republican sentiments and, well, they felt that their contract with the British government was just about up. 
The revolution, though hard fought and for a plethora of reasons, was just about straightforward principle, liberty against a perceived tyranny, and so forth. It was the first time a citizenry had stood up to the ancient regimes of Europe and won, which was inspiring to the revolutionary spirit of liberalism everywhere, but what was even more inspiring was the early American model. The early American model was formed on the theories of natural rights by John Locke and the ideas of the separation of powers from Montesquieu. It was based on the individual holding their own fate in their hands rather than a king who ruled them from across the world. What's more is that it proved that not only were these ancient empires not infallible, they were replaceable entirely. But, if a colony that was thousands of miles from their king could successfully revolt and win independence, could a people within the same country do the same? Now this brings me to my favorite political topic. Now, I won't go too deeply into it, as there are countless documentaries on the subject, but in my humblest of opinions, the French Revolution, despite being quite a bloody affair, was perhaps the most important philosophical revolution in human history. And the ideas formed during this time feature quite heavily in my more academic writings, but I digress. I believe that every major political ideology, at least in use today, has its roots in, one way or another, the French Revolution. In the chaos of the revolution, the core aspects of classical liberalism would split, with philosophies, codes of ethics, and ideologies succeeding it, such as modern liberalism, conservatism, libertarianism, anarchism, and so many other isms your head will spin. Oh, and did I mention all of these were umbrella terms? Yeah, I only mentioned the tip of the iceberg, and even those have split into ideologies. Yeah, this is my bread and butter. In fact, I'm writing a whole collection of essays detailing how we got from here to uh, here. But why read those when you can enjoy these fine primo video essays I've put together? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to a series I'm really going to enjoy putting together, so be sure to join me next time. And be sure to leave a comment down there, and don't be shy. These videos are really my own interpretation, and, well, I'm more than eager to hear yours. I've been Mr. Minarchist. Be sure to keep your head on a swivel out there. After all, it is a big, big world.